Hey, it's Mazzy here and welcome back. This is an episode of Mazzy's Mix, a series I do uh, every once in a while where I showcase uh, records that have come in from various labels as well as the things I pre-ordered, picked up locally at my stores. Uh, mostly new records, not all new music, uh, some reissues and some things that haven't uh, actually been issued or uh, limited editions types of things and, and some from some uh, independent artists as well. But uh, in these mix videos, occasionally I'll show other items like books and, and posters and art pieces. And I want to start out, I got sent uh, these these letterpress gift cards, uh, greeting cards, if you uh, will, uh, by a designer that I've known for maybe 30 years now. Uh, he was an art director in one of the ad agencies in San Francisco that I worked uh, at frequently, also a guitar player, but an amazing designer. And he's doing these, uh, like a side project. He has this letterpress setup. And if you don't know letterpress, it's where you literally take the various type letters and put it together all you know, was it I Gutenberg type of press, beautifully designed, and they're always limited because it's not an ongoing, uh, uh, you know, four color press set setups. So they tend to be more expensive and more time consuming. But but people who want, who like limited pieces like this might appreciate these, especially because the subject matter. I wouldn't just show cards just to show cards, but you'll see once I show them. So Rylander design. I'll put a link below. I think he. Uh, sells these uh, directly because they look like they're uh, directed. They're actually, uh, look at this. Okay, first of all, this is the one, obviously, uh, if you know Rocky, George Harrison's guitar. And these are uh, limited edition type letterpress things, but look at that, look how beautiful that is. And on the back, it literally has like a little bio about the guitar. And in this case, George Harrison's Rocky Strat. Harrison bought the guitar in 1965 and so on. So it tells the history of Rocky. And it also includes, his company is Sweet Bippy Press that does his letterpress. So there's a guitar pick of his letterpress company. I think these are just beautiful. I don't know how many he's done. I have three here, but there's Rocky. There is um, Mark Knopfler's National Style O. Look at that, and it's got a metallic a finish to it. How beautiful is that? These will be for special occasion type things, uh, cards when you don't want to buy some uh, shit ass Hallmark brand uh, massive American greeting card. But it talks about uh, this was featured on the cover of Brothers in Arms, the Dire, Dire Straits album. And lastly, Dwayne Allman's Gibson Les Paul. Look at how beautiful that is. He played on Layla and other assorted songs with Eric Clapton, the first two Almond Brothers records. So uh, Ryland Design, great. You know, if you're a guitar fan and you like, uh, you know, limited art pieces in a way, whether you use them to send to a friend, family member, Mazzy, a little note to me, uh, or just want collectibles, a beautiful little thing. But first, I want to show this. I got this some years ago. I found it in a store. Um, a local, like a DJ store that had a section of um, independent releases, uh, off kilter, uh, smaller label releases. And this is Strata by Scully Sveverson with the great guitar player, Bill Frizzell. So it's two guitar players. Uh, Scully or Scully or Scully uh, plays acoustic guitar or electric guitar and acoustic bass. And of course, uh, Bill Frizzell plays guitars as well. And I had forgotten how beautiful this record it was. And I, while I was changing turntables, that'll be in a future video and, and cartridge, I played this. And this is one of the most beautiful sounding records. It's a chill record. It's just as beautiful ethereal. If you know Bill Frizzell's guitar playing, almost like that vibrato sound, the two of them together is just amazing. The record is called Strata. And now this is on the... Uh, Nouvelle label originally came out in 2017. And up until recently, this was $150 on Discogs. And I just noticed because a friend of mine uh, was interested in it and it is available now. You can get it, I think they pressed another, I don't know, thousand copies or something. So you can get it for $50 at the Nouvelle, uh, Newell, N-E-W-V-E-L-L-E -E -L -L -E records uh, website. Ships pretty fast. Uh, she got it like, within a couple of days, which was su surprising. So it's a French label, but I think they have distribution and, a, and uh, distribution and uh, 
presence in America and the U.S. as well, but such a beautiful record. If you like just a very chill, kind of jazzy, um, somewhat ambient uh, record, uh, this is one to check out, and it is available now. Now, I got a series of records uh, from this label, JMI Records, this jazz label out of New York City, and what they specialize is small press records of all analog. They cut to tape, they master to tape, everything is done to tape, and they're amazing recorded records. And I got a series I really, really like, and for different reasons. And I wanna start out with this one. This is probably my favorite. This is Sasha Berliner, and she's this young vibraphonist, and I'm a big fan of the vibraphone. Uh, she, uh, originally from San Francisco, relocated to New York, so we're both San Francisco natives here. But this record, uh, apparently she plays the four mallet style of vibes. Very much, I think, like Gary Burden used to play. Uh, he has a lot of records on ECM. I, I've seen, in terms of the vibraphonists that I've seen back in the 70s into the 80s, are, are people like Bo Bobby Hutcherson, who lived in the Bay Area. Uh, Gary Burton would come around, of course, Cal Jader, that really morphed into a Latin side jazz. But what's amazing about this, it's, it's a different take on it. Um, sometimes there's a little Gary Burton in there. Sometimes, you know, you can hear the Bobby Hutcherson. But she's got this really, there's a modern sound, and there's a more of a vibrato sound than some of her playing that I recall hearing, even with Bobby Hutcherson. And I'm not quite sure if that's done with pedals and stuff, or the it's the uh, it's the sort of reflective thing of the four uh, mallets. I don't know. I'm not that well versed in the sound of it. But she's got this uh, four piece band around her that has uh, of um, electric piano and acoustic piano. That's uh, James Francis. There's a, a track on here, actually. On side two, there's two different versions of My Funny Valentine. Uh, first of all, a solo vibe version. Then it goes into a version with the, you know, the piano kind of leads in. And it, what I was starting to think, it was reminding me of something. It reminded me of uh, Chick Corea's My Spanish Heart album. A little bit, just slightly a tinge of, of the piano playing that Chick played on that album. But not exactly, but it just, you know, sometimes you get this sense memory of other music like that, but just gorgeous. The opening track, Jade, is a stunner here. And she's got a modernist sound uh, with this entire band. Also, Bernice Travis, a second acoustic electric bass, Marcus Gilmore on drums, Jalid Shaw on alto sax. One track with uh, Thana Alex on vocals, only the one track, but this is an ethereal record, but it's it's, not a totally a laid back record. It is got a, a vibe to it, look, you know, excuse the pun, but that is uh, cool, immediate, but some of the um, arrangements get in a little bit of meditative, spiritual thing somewhat. This came out, I think two years ago, year and a half ago on uh, JMI Records. Uh, young woman, I think she's 25, 26 years old only working on another project right now, but uh, pick this one up. This woman is killer. Um, I'm also a fan, I'm excited. Another Vibe record coming out on Blue Note is Jill Ross, who's a New Yorker. So uh, this first section is really kind of new jazz artists. And lastly of the uh, uh, JMI stuff is Ray Angry One. He's a, a, I think he's a member of The Roots out of New York, also a session player and producer. Uh, this is a really gorgeous album as well. This piano playing, it's got a lightness to it, but it interacts beautifully uh, with the other instruments. Beautiful cover, actually, but look, and look at this photograph. Talk about someone who sports a beautiful, beautiful hat there. Oh, God, that's quite the feather, feather in the cap, right? This is a beautifully recorded record. Uh, Ray Angry, the album is called One. Uh, this came out in 2018, so this is not a new record. But this is a killer record as well. I love the mood to it. I love the, um, I love his playing on here. And what I'm excited about is that um, he, there's a trio album coming out on JMI that I highly recommend you check out. I pre-ordered it. I think it doesn't come out on um, vinyl, the four records, until March. But it's it's the record's called Plum, and it's a trio, a jam trio that they worked on. I think over was it two sessions maybe. 
and it's Ray Angry on piano. It's got David Murray and Questlove, and it's called um, Plum. I guess it's done in a way like a, where Bitches Brew, where they just did uh, this recording and they kind of edited it together to make this long session. Instead of editing it down, I guess it was a jam session originally. Mm -hmm. Three musicians would work, but um, that is gonna be a big release, and uh, I highly recommend you check that out. Plum on JMI Records. Uh, I think it's already available for streaming, so you can go check it out at, at, at their uh, website and in Bandcamp as well. So JMI Records, a cool label. Again, everything they do up to this point is all analog uh, to tape. There is the uh, monthly Blue Note Classic Series. I just went up to showcase one because this one blew me away and was surprised. I'm a big fan, if you watch the channel, of uh, Bebop. My pal, of course, is one of the originators of Bebop with Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker, piano player. This is a fantastic, this really has a groove to it. And I love the sound of this record. 51, 49, 53, the amazing Bud Powell. There's uh, two takes on here, opening up with Un Poco Loco, uh, first take and second take. And it's got a little bit of that percussive, you know, there was a whole Afro-Cuban thing happening uh, early on with, with um, you know, some of these jazz artists when uh, bebop was happening. Of course, more with uh, Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, but um, this has a drive to it. On drums, first you have Max Roach with that very heavy, uh, almost like a cowbell thing that could be a little irritating at times. But once you get in, it's only like on one or two, two tracks, I believe. But then it kind of tapers back. And then on, also you have Roy Haynes on drums on uh, other tracks here. Side two opens up with a great, uh, two versions actually, of Night in Tunisia, Tunisia which is that fantastic uh, song co-written um, by Dizzy Gillespie. Just love, anytime I hear that song, it's got a great, a great that great Cuban uh, sound to it. Bud Powell's one of the great piano players. And I say, if you don't have any Bud Powell, this would be a nice uh, introduction to Bud Powell, but it's it's a driving record and it's just a really accessible, great jazz record, a great sound to it. And then the Tone Poet, I'm just showing one right now that I got because I love soul jazz and I love the um, B3 organ, but this is a saxophone player, Lou Donaldson, and this is Midnight Creeper. <laughs> And this has uh, Blue Mitchell on trumpet, Lou Donaldson, alto sax, George Benson, guitar, Lonnie Smith on organ, um, and uh, Leo Morris on drum. Heavy organ on this, heavy uh, B3 organ, so it's got that really kind of funky soul jazz feel. There he is, there's uh, Lou Donaldson right there, a beautiful uh, Francis Wolf photograph. It does come with an insert, a color insert up from the session. This is, what, uh, what year was this, the late? 60s, I believe this is 1968, there. So it's got a color insert this time. I think this is the first I remember that has a separate insert rather than the um, you know gatefold because I think this originally was a gatefold. This beautiful portrait of Philip Glass of the, um, the collection of the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, a cover painting by Louise Alvarez Rore. If you don't know Philip Glass, a minimalist composer, got a repetitive style always. And what's beautiful about this, this is a solo piano record. He's done solo piano records before, uh, but he's kind of revisiting uh, some of his previous music. This is recorded sort of in the midst or towards the end of um, the pandemic in 2021, May, over three days, recorded in his apartment, and it's recorded on the piano. He plays the piano that he he composes on. He's usually, you know, does studio work, uh, works with a lot of uh, minimalist artists. He does soundtracks. He's worked with everybody from the Kronos Quartet. That's uh, to soundtracks to uh, the movie Secret Agent, to Koyana Squatsi and Pawa Squatsi. All these songs he's done before. And in the intro, he talks about how some of these songs have an ambient to him because in his apartment, occasionally you can hear hints of this, of the city street outside uh, not a lot, and it's not intrusive at all. This is a personal record. This is a record of, of time and place, uh, obviously, at, uh, during the pandemic and the end of the pandemic. So I think it's a beautiful recording. So highly recommended Philip Glass's uh, Philip Glass solo 
another uh, wonderful solo piano record. Next, I want to show a couple albums that came in uh, from Light in the Attic. And I have been a big fan of their reissue series going back over a decade, well over a decade, of the work of Lee Hazelwood. Now, Lee Hazelwood, if you don't know him by name, uh, he was the great producer, collaborator, songwriter of the work and made those great Nancy Sinatra records of the late 60s really popular. He wrote Boots Are Made For Walking. He collaborated and sang uh, a version of Jackson, a song you may know from Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash, uh, what they collaborated on. Also, Some Velvet Morning, that great kind of neo-psychedelic pop hit. Low, gravelly, beautiful voice. Um, 1972, he moves to Sweden, and I'm gonna show these two records here, Cowboy in Sweden and 13. This is a record that um, when he was in Sweden, he was working on some recording and he worked uh, with an artist, a singer named Larry Marks, I believe his name is. Uh, apparently Larry Marks was the voice of the theme song for Scooby-Doo. And this is kind of a funky, it's got horns. It's almost unlike a lot of the stuff that he did with the Wrecking Crew in LA with Nancy Sinatra and those collaborations. And, and after a while, he basically had this whole record and he eventually scrubbed the vocals of Larry Marks and did his own vocals over it. And that's what this is about. Uh, an album that was, I guess, never released or wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, number 13 in a series uh, uh, from Light in the Attic. There are some tracks and outtakes and demos on the other side. Occasionally, I think some of these have been released on some of the other outtakes of some of the other Light in the Attic record. That's a label and a series that I wish I had every record. I just, I didn't get them when they were easily available and now you know, a number of them are long out of print, and I have maybe five or six of the records uh, that uh, Light in the Attic has put out, Lee Hayes. Well, I'm at all in on this guy. He's like the cowboy, the Hollywood cowboy that wanted to be a cowboy that moves up, ends up, gets up. I think didn't even tell Nancy Sinatra he was moving to Sweden. But this is the record, and I'd never heard this record in the day, Cowboy in Sweden. This is fantastic. He lived in Sweden, records this record. This is, out of all these, this is the one of the new series that I would pick up. Um, and I just love this. I mean, it, again, it's cowboy pop music. His vocals, his arrangements and his, his vocals make this stuff extra special. I just love this. Light in the Attic is doing this great series. They're also have been doing a, a wonderful uh, reissue campaign of Nancy Sinatra's records. They did a Greatest Hits record. They did the Lee uh, Hazelwood and Nancy Sinatra album, the albums from Reprise. Several times a year, they're um, putting out those records. Light in the Attic, Lee Hazelwood, Cowboy in Sweden. And now the last segment is pop music, pop, rock and roll, catchy things, power pop. I'm going to start with this. This is First Boy in the Moon. This is called Cyber Girl. It's got this beautiful cover image of the model, uh, Jean Shrimpton. Uh, look at how great is that with that red screen over it. Uh, this is produced, the, the main uh, protagonist, the artist is uh, David Pedroza. It's his project. He writes all the music. He's an expatriate American who lives in Sweden now. Put this out independent, again, like everything else. Uh, the independent projects here, I'll put links in down there. So if you're interested in this stuff, you can get it through Bandcamp or the artist's website. Uh, this is a power pop album with a lot of great hooks to it. Great kind of cover design. This is their second album. I do have the first one. It's got a similar kind of cover uh, with a the boy with the glasses, blue tint to it. So obviously he's repeating uh, a great way to kind of keep you know your visual uh, branding in a way. I hate to put branding and advertising in terms of records, but certain artists will continue a certain look. So, you know, think back even to Roger Dean and Yes and, and artists like that, or, or Hypnosis with some of the bands uh, they worked with. You got a, a design style, it really works, it works. But this is again, a fun record, great hook. This one's on red vinyl, and this is uh, Cyber Girl, First Boy on the Moon is the name of his uh, band project. This is a record, and I can't for the life of me remember how I heard about this. This is a woman out of San Francisco. I think this is her third or fourth record. Her name is Anna Hilberg. 
Uh, I just love this. This is a wonderful photograph. She's a guitar player and a singer. She writes great hooks as well. And the song I heard, there's a video on YouTube. I'll put a link below to the video because you need to check that out. It's called Girl, Girl, Girl. Great hooks. You know, I, I'm not going to even say she's from the riot, riot Girl movement because she's not as punky as that. It's more power pop. Great hooks, great melodies. She's got this, you know, she's playing the Gretsch here. I assume that's the guitar she plays. So she's got that little uh, sort of vibrato, you know, Chet Atkins side to things. Um, but really good songwriting, really catchy. I don't know anything else about her, but that she's living in San Francisco. Uh, this is an independent record. Anna Hilberg is her name. This came out last, end of last year, the tail end of it. And for whatever reason, that girls, girls, girls thing is like a earworm. In fact, a lot of the songs in here are earworms. Once you play this record, all you need is twice. It, you keep hearing the songs over and over again. And it's the kind of a song that I'm sure will turn up on some you know, television show or film because it's got that, that really accessible sound to it. But the guitar playing is really interesting too. It's, it's not flashy, but it's got that kind of vibrato a little bit of a surf twang uh, to it, maybe a little country twang, but it's not country music by any stretch. But uh, Anna Hilberg, and this is Tired Girls. Been wanting to do a uh, whole video on eels and uh, just haven't had a chance, just haven't got into it. I'm an all in on Mark Everett Oliver eels since Novocaine for the Soul was shown on MTV and that first record. And I've said, uh, I've talked about him before, uh, probably in my uh, It's the Music Stupid and maybe some other videos, that he's an LA recording artist. It's really him. The Project of the Eels is him. And I have, uh, I saw them about three months ago in Seattle. I've seen them maybe five or six times. He's got this throaty voice, but he writes hooks as well. He is one of those artists that his records sound like you've heard them before. It sounds like you've heard these songs before, but it's not that he's ripping anyone off. He rewrites things. His songs have been used on countless motion pictures going back, I think, from Shrek. So he, obviously um, he's getting publishing, which is great from being in those films because they're very accessible. They're childlike in a way because they're simple, but they're simple without being um, repetitive. And some of them are quirky and, and their irony and the lyrics are, are funny. And, and he's doing a series. This is the Essential Eels. Uh, I think these were originally on compact discs. This is a two record set. This is volume two. This is uh, in a way a hits package with extra things. For instance, side four has Royal Pain from Shrek the Third, Man Up from the motion picture Yes Man, Man I Keep Trying from Prisoner's Daughter, Jazz Has an uh, Unreleased Song, and Christmas Why You Gotta Do Me Like This, another Christmas unreleased song. He has a great sort of web store and his songs and his albums are being reissued on vinyl constantly in a good way. And I like that he has that, that roadmap to get getting vinyl albums released. And Eels, so good, Essential Eels, volume two. I'm a big fan and uh, highly recommend this. The last two are records that I pre-ordered months ago and I've been waiting for. And of course, the one that you've probably seen around lately is Wall of the Eyes, The Smile. Uh, this is uh, the uh, super group in a way or the project, uh, most notably Tom York from Radiohead. It's got his voice. It's got Johnny Greenwood also from Radiohead Guitar and Synthesizers. Tom Skinner from uh, that jazz outfit. Blanking out on the name right now. That kind of post-punky uh, jazz trio. Um, kismet something. Uh, wonderful uh, drummer. Wonderful kind of a jazzy drummer. What, I like this record better than the first one. I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them on tour. This one seems to be there's a little more of a uh, I, I'm almost saying the Johnny Greenwood influence of that neoclassical. There's a certain etherealness to it uh, that's really, really uh, gorgeous in there. 
the synthesizers and the orchestral uh, arrangements that Johnny Greenwood has done on this record are just beautiful. He's done some soundtracks and movie scores. Uh, there Will Be Blood, uh, worked obviously with Paul Thomas Anderson on several of his movies. You've got the artwork by Stanley Donwood and Tom York. Stanley Donwood has done most of the, I don't know, last 10, 15 years, 20 years of Radiohead, going back, I guess, to 2001, was that the first year when he did um, Kid A, uh, that artwork, great painter, great artist. And they, that's where I love the collaboration between a, a musician and an, a, a visual artist, and when they collaborate on albums. So uh, a fantastic album, a, a really a beautiful record ethereal to a point, but uh, the smile, wall of eyes. Finally, we're at the end here. This is the new album by Griff Reese. Griff Reese was the main singer, the lead singer and songwriter of Super Furry Animals, uh, a group out of Wales. I love Super Furry Animals. Have they broken up? Are they on hiatus? They haven't done anything well over a decade now. But uh, I've been all in on his solo records. They're more poppy. It takes away some of the electronics that the rest of the band add. I did show uh, one of my favorite albums of last year was Das Coolies, which is basically the rest of Super Fur Animals, which is very a bombastic electronica record. This is totally the opposite. This is the more melodic pop record. It's like a lounge record. It's got a little bit of a jazzy, one maybe semi-country uh tinge to it, but really accessible, really beautiful. Is it light pop? I don't think so. I just think it's clever lyrics. It's a fun record. The record is called Sadness Sets Me Free. I'm thinking this might be his fifth or sixth album. I have every single solo album he's done. And so far, this is one of my favorites. Uh, I think it was a Candy Lion, whatever that one's called, something like that. It was a record I really like. But when you listen to his solo albums, you really see where he came from in his songwriting with Super Furry, that these kind of really hysterical lyrics and uh, poignant lyrics at times and uh, mocking uh, society and people uh, just really kind of comes out in his lyrics here. Uh, Sadness Sets Me Free, Bad Friends, Celestial Candy Floss, Peace Signs, they sold my home to build a skyscraper. He's got a little bit of a, I wouldn't say he's like a Randy Newman where Randy Newman has that like that esoteric, uh, just biting lyricist. He's got his own way of doing that, but I love the arrangements on this. It's very poppy, but it's less um, electronic that at the end uh, Super Furry was doing. You really see how the, um, the mix of Das Coolies now and him would be even an interesting dynamic. I don't see, it'd be interesting to see what they would do today because I wish they would do more records because they're all talented as hell. But this is a wonderful record. Um, it, it's in it, but it's a kind of a, a soft record. It's not a big bombastic record like the Das Coolies or even like the later a Super Furry, even some of his records. Um, Sometimes he has a little bit of a soulness to his pop. Again, it's not an outright soul record, but it's got a little bit of that uh, blue-eyed soul thing happening occasionally on this record. So uh, Griff Reese from the Super Free Animals, his solo record, Sadness Sets Me Free. That was quite the mix today, a lot of stuff. But thanks for watching. Check these out. Links below to some of this stuff. Otherwise, you uh, have the Google and you can search it and seek it out yourself. Thanks for watching. Mazzy loves you.